These men are Bijagos, members of an ethnic group from Guinea-Bissau in Western Africa. They begin their initiation at the age of 12. During the two weeks before leaving for the forest to accomplish the final steps towards making them respected men, they dance every evening. To overcome the terrible ordeals that await them, they rely on the energy which the shark dance gives them. The shark is the incarnation of wildness, strength, aggression, and sexual potency. By imitating him, the men learn to control and to channel the raw animal energy inside themselves. Here, the shark is neither good nor evil, but simply a force of nature. How is he looked upon elsewhere? What place does this magnificent predator occupy in man's imagination? This is what we are going to discover on a journey that will take us from the Orient to the Occident, through legends, religious beliefs, and myths. But first, where did the shark come from? When and how did man first come into contact with him? The evolution of sharks began 400 million years ago. We can distinguish two important periods. The initial period was during the first era, between 400 and 200 million years ago. We have groups of armored fish called placoderms, which were probably the ancestors of the shark. During this first era, we can recognize sharks by their teeth, their ventricles, and their spiked bodies. The second period was during the second era. First, placoderms disappeared and sharks diversified. In the middle of this era, which we call Jurassic, the age of dinosaurs, we see almost all forms of sharks as we know them today. So we can say that when man appeared three million years ago, Lucy could have been familiar with all forms of existent sharks, such as the great white shark, the mako, the sand tiger shark, and of course the famous megalodon, which disappeared about a million years ago, and who left us these gigantic teeth. The megalodon was the size of a whale shark, with the aggressive nature of its contemporary cousin, the great white shark. He was a true Tyrannosaurus of the sea, whose favorite prey was the whale. Fortunately, he disappeared before Lucy's descendants learned how to swim. We don't know when or how the first significant encounters between man and shark took place, although we suppose they were something like these images. Archaeological sites have revealed that at least 40,000 years ago, man, in search of food, realized the importance of fish, and before he developed specific fishing techniques, used the only techniques he knew, the ones he used for hunting. Armed probably with a pointed wooden stake, he would hunt for fish at the water's edge. Later, after becoming an underwater hunter, man and the shark became competitors, with the shark fighting hard to steal his opponent's prey. Archaeological finds indicate that these initial encounters, which sometimes led to confrontation, took place in a very auspicious area, the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean, where the relief often of volcanic or coral origin, formed shallow, warm-water lagoons. 
Man still lives there in close symbiosis with the sea, since in these regions, the marine animal biodiversity is greater than that of land animals, and thus a primary resource. In the Salomon Island village of Laulasi, when someone dies, his body is offered to the sharks. Only the head is conserved in small bamboo traps. By talking to the shark, we speak to our ancestors, whose spirit lives on in the animal's body. It's these same ancestors who ask the living to dance and to offer sacrifices in honor of Bakwa, the shark god, since he has the power to make fishing abundant and to prevent shark attacks. This pig is about to be sacrificed. A few generations ago, before the intervention of missionaries, the sacrifices were human. The women sing, imploring Bakwa to protect their husbands and their children. People spend several hours a day here in shark-infested waters, and they claim that no one has ever been attacked, except for one man who didn't believe in Bakwa's power. A little later, the pig's entrails are offered to the sharks. According to the Laulasi, if Bakwa accepts the offering, this shark will be the first to eat. If the small black spotted sharks take the food first, it is considered a bad omen, signifying that Bakwa has not listened to the men's prayers. In the end, however, the sacred shark takes the sacrifice. and the other sharks will only share what's left over. The entire village sings and dances for joy. Once again, the natural order has been respected. Not very far north, at Kantu, in Papua New Guinea, the shark is the central figure of a magical and sacred ritual. The shark callers, as the men call themselves, prove their courage and their strength by capturing the animal. They call him by stirring up the water with a noisemaker made of coconuts woven together on a vine. They capture the shark with a slipknot and a wooden floater carved in the form of a propeller.
Marod tells the men to summon the sharks with magic. He has also given men the power to communicate with their ancestors. It all began with Maroa. In the beginning, he created the shark. And then later, he created man and gave him these powers. But the first shark was caught by Maroa. It was Maroa? Yes. At dawn, he went to sea in his boat. He shook the coconuts, and the shark appeared. His magic had worked. It was the same magic we use today. By Moroa, you mean God? The Christian church and the government call him God. But in our language, he is Moroa. Moroa also insisted that man not have sexual relations or eat land animals before leaving to capture the shark. When going out to sea, one must make a complete break with the land. If a fisherman transgresses this law, he will fail. His magic will not work. Although men fish for him, the shark remains a king and is treated accordingly. The slipknot is described as a floral wreath, and the floater a pillow for the animal to rest his head. Now they tell us that if we continue our traditional way of life, we will not go to heaven. But we, the village chiefs, cannot believe that. If we live as we have always lived, our spirit will certainly be with God. And if we don't, it will not. When I am dead and buried, if I have not followed our traditions, God will reject me. They are destroying our customs, and we don't know why. We search for reasons for them being against our traditions, but we cannot find any. Why are they against them? Koran lives in Ambrim, another of Vanuatu's 40 islands. He's recently installed a winch on his traditional boat, which enables him to fish for snapper, a handsome red fish that lives in very deep water. For a while now, Koran has had problems with sharks. They eat all his fish before he can raise them to the surface. For him, there is only one explanation. Someone or something has put a magic spell on him. He has to consult the sorcerers who live in the interior of the island.
Ambrim is a mysterious island known for its very powerful and easily offended sorcerers. Tofor is the most powerful and the most feared. It takes courage for Koran to seek advice from him since Tofor is not from his village. And his advice, like a trial sentence, has to be followed to the letter. Your way of fishing is new, and the Yarima spirits don't like it. Your reel takes you too far into their space. The sharks that eat your fish are merely the instruments of discontented spirits. In the past, when enemies were about to destroy our clan, the sorcerers combined all their power and carved a breadfruit tree in the shape of a shark. They slid inside it, and the trunk came to life. It became a shark and devoured all our enemies. If the sharks are against you today, it's because you have committed an error. You did not think about whether the spirits would let you fish or not. You must ask for their forgiveness. You must make a ceremony and sacrifice a pig. That is the custom. On Bora Bora, one of the most touristic of Polynesian atolls, men like Teoira like to tell this story. Taoroa, the Polynesian god who created the world, had a beautiful blue shark. The men would swim with him and even let their children climb onto his back. One day, the men got it into their heads that the shark was evil, and they decided to kill him. Two brave brothers were assigned the job. Once they had pierced his head with a spear, Daharoa became furious and reappeared, bringing his beautiful blue shark back to life. Ever since, fearing the wrath of Taharoa, the men respect the shark. Although the shark has become a profitable attraction here, the men have not forgotten the place he occupies in their culture. Teoira recalls that in the past, the shark, by carrying the spirits of the dead, enabled them to become ancestors. Teoira only fishes for sharks when it's absolutely necessary, and occasionally likes to repeat the movements his ancestors used to capture them. In addition to being both prey and predator, the shark is also a social partner, a companion, a god, and perhaps a dispenser of justice. 
If, for example, man is attacked by a shark, man is to blame and not the shark. Oceanic people are never indifferent to the shark. For them, the shark is not looked upon negatively as he is in Western societies. For a long time, Western man never ventured out on the high seas and confined himself to the coastal waters. All existing ancient rock drawings dealing with the shark represent him with ambiguity. The Bible takes no account of him. The first mention of him is undoubtedly in Babylonian mythology. The monster Bull, which literally means the devourer who swallowed up young girls, and Histuba, a brave hero who killed him, thus saving the coastal population from this scourge. Later, in the 5th century BC, the renowned Greek historian Herodotus recounts what happened to part of Darius's fleet near Mount Athos. It was thrown against the reefs, and the sailors died, not by drowning, in spite of a horrible storm, but by being seized and eaten by monsters with sharp teeth. The Romans knew more about sharks than the Greeks, and even distinguished the most dangerous species. When Pliny the Elder, in the first century AD, says that sea dogs can be threatening, he is referring to small sharks which are hard to identify, but which can threaten fishermen by attacking them at the ankles or injuring their groin. However, he said, all one had to do was stand up to them, try to frighten them, and they would go away. Thus the monster was demystified to some extent. In the Middle Ages, the shark barely appears in works dealing with animals. The role he played, however, was totally allegorical, symbolizing worldly temptations to which good Christians must not succumb. He was the devouring mouth of evil, capable of swallowing up an honest man. The shark at that time was very often known as Lamy, a term of Greek origin referring to a devouring mythological monster. In fact, the diabolical image of the shark, as we know him in the Western world, dates mainly from the Middle Ages. From the Renaissance onward, with the development of zoology and anatomy, with scientists such as Rondelet and Bellon, the image of the shark changes radically. Dissection demystified the Lamy. Actually, Rondelet and Belon, the founders of French ichthyology, tried to demonstrate that the Lamy was a fish like any other, a potentially dangerous predator, of course, like the white shark, for example, but a creature which was part of the natural order, in spite of the mythology surrounding it. At the beginning of the 20th century, the shark began to be perceived as a vital part of the fishing industry, an animal with natural substances useful in making cosmetics or even vitamin A, but no longer as a monster or bogeyman of the ocean. This voracious animal had been almost domesticated by the industry in the early 20th century. But the sea still conceals many mysteries and sometimes casts up very strange creatures, as here in Kerqueville, France in 1934. Dr. Petit, the assistant director of the fishing laboratory of the museum, studied this curious animal on the site. It had the head of a camel, the fins of a chimera, the skin of a seal, the flesh of a rayfish, and the hairs of an elephant. The scientist said he thought he was in the presence of a salation, a sort of gigantic cartilaginous fish. Actually, the reporter had distorted the words of Dr. Petit, who had identified a basking shark. It was this kind of distortion of the more rational view of sharks presented by naturalists of the period which perpetuated the popular image of the killer shark as represented by the press and in literature. Back to Africa, to the south of the continent, on the huge island of Madagascar and the Vez people. The Vez are among the last nomadic peoples of the Indian Ocean. Just a few decades ago, they had no interest in sharks, since they only fish off flat boats in shallow water. Then one day, with the arrival of fishing nets, 
the Vez met up with some Chinese merchants who showed them that they could earn money shark fishing, since the shark's fins were an important part of Asiatic cuisine. Some Vez became specialists in capturing sharks. The Vez, however, are animists, which means they attribute a soul to every animal, phenomenon, or natural object. This new kind of fishing, therefore, disturbed the elders, who feared that the natural order of things would be troubled. A legend soon appeared. One day, a fisherman's boat was pulled down to the bottom of the sea by a horrible beast. Just when he thought all was lost, a shark approached him and said, don't be frightened, I'm not going to attack you. We are both children of the sea, and so you must tell your brothers that although they may fish for us, they must not exterminate us. Then the shark brought the man home. Ever since, in memory of their brother who was saved by a shark, the Vez respect this animal. Shark fishing has become a prestigious activity, strengthening the alliance between man and animal. Thousands of kilometers from here, on the other side of the Indian Ocean, in the Sunda Strait separating the Indonesian islands of Java and Sumatra, strong hands bring up a fishing line used for sharks. Today, one of the 80 thick steel hooks has caught a huge beast. He's a tiger shark, one of the fiercest of all species who will even devour his fellow sharks. This specimen, measuring more than four and a half meters, was caught on the line while lunging for a smaller shark, which he devoured in its entirety, except for the head. The shark is still alive, and the men struggle to pull him aboard. They pull with all their strength but the almost 500 kilogram animal nearly capsizes their boat. In spite of the danger of other sharks being attracted to the blood, the braver fishermen dive in to attach the rope to the monster's tail. This rope will enable them to anchor the animal to the side of the boat so that he can be pulled towards the nearest beach where they can cut him up more easily. After a two-hour struggle, the shark finally dies of suffocation. Like 90% of all Indonesians, these fishermen are Muslim. They believe in one God, Allah, and his prophet, Muhammad. Therefore, this shark, too big for their boat, does not play a major role in their imaginations. In this part of Asia, what has saved the shark is the fact that this type of fishing is limited to artisans who either use or sell every part of the shark. Nothing is wasted, 